welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. So last week we spoke about the absolutely horrific case of Poppy van der Maver and if you haven't seen that I will link it up here for you but please just be aware of that story it is quite graphic and so is the story that we're going to talk about today so please keep that in mind when watching this video. Today we are going to talk about the case of Tanya Flower Day and how this case is solved but it's also not really solved and I would like you to let me know what you think down in the comments of who you think is actually guilty in this case. But with that being said, please keep in mind that this case is quite graphic. But enough babbling from me and let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Tanya Kelly Flowerday was born on the 7th of November 1984 in Johannesburg, South Africa. Her dad's name is Bob and her mom's name is Dolores and Bob actually owns quite a few successful takeaway chains and he was actually opening up another one when Tanya was around 17, 18 years old. So he was opening up another takeaway place where he really wanted Tanya to be the manager and the main owner of this so that she could eventually then grow into managing all of the businesses once her parents pass on and it would be kind of like a family legacy. Legacy. because Tanya was Bob and Dolores' only child so they were an incredibly close-knit family and they just wanted to share everything and this was part of Bob's legacy that he wanted to leave behind. Tanya was also incredibly close with her friends. She had a very small tight-knit unit of friends and she had a very lasting impact on her friends. So like I said Bob was trying to open up a new chain of restaurants when Tanya was roughly around 17-18 years old so when Tanya finished high school she hopped straight into working for her dad's business at this new restaurant and she was doing very well. She was managing it and she was learning from the bottom of how to run a successful business with her father. Also, while Tanya was busy running this takeaway place, her friends would come and eat there and it was just a very nice casual dining experience with everyone and she was happy and she was thriving. So I'm not really one for believing in bad luck in terms of dates like Friday the 13th. However, I think for many people in the story, Friday the 13th is an incredibly horrific day for the Flower Day family. So on Friday the 13th of June, 2008, Three, Tanya asked her dad if he could please drop her off at a club because one of Tanya's friends would be performing that night at the said club and Tanya had asked her dad for a lift because she had just turned 18 and she didn't have her driver's license yet so her dad said not a problem so Tanya gets ready that day and now she's ready to head out. She grabs her ID, her cell phone, a jacket and some money obviously to buy alcohol or whatever else she was going to buy at the club. So like I said Tanya lived in Joburg and they drove to an area called Randburg where this club was and this club was called Julian's Bistro but I don't think it exists anymore but it used to be called that back in the day. So Bob then rocks up in the front of the club with the car and Tanya then gets out of the passenger side and then Bob kind of leans over the passenger side looks out the window and he's like Tanya don't forget to give me a call once you're safe and once you want me to come fetch you. Tanya then says thank you to her dad. They exchange glances and smiles and then Tanya walks and disappears into the crowd and through the front door. And sadly, unbeknownst to Bob, that would be the last time that he would ever see his daughter alive. So Bob then leaves Randberg and he then drives home. He then tries to settle and just kind of rest for the night because he knew Tanya would probably only call him at about 1 or 2 a.m. So he then got into bed with his wife Dolores. They then read some books, they chatted and they both eventually inevitably fall asleep. But then the next morning, Saturday the 14th of June, Bob woke up with such a fright because it was now light outside, he was hearing the birds chirping outside and he then rolled over quickly to see his phone, he grabbed his phone and now Dolores is kind of waking up as well. He then says to his wife Dolores, I haven't got a call from Tanya yet. So Bob then sits up in his bed and he's trying to look through his phone, maybe there's a message, maybe there's something from Tanya but there's absolutely nothing. So then he decides okay he's gonna get dressed, he's gonna shower and then he's going to call every single one of Tanya's friends to see if maybe she went to sleep over and got a lift with someone else and maybe her phone died and that's why she wasn't able to tell her dad where she is. So he gets dressed and showered like I said and then he starts dialing every one of Tanya's friends and sadly none of them know or have seen Tanya since the night before. So Bob is obviously still stressing and so is Dolores but they knew that Tanya had a shift later that afternoon at her restaurant and he knew that she never ever missed these shifts so when the time came and went that she was actually supposed to be at work he knew that something was horrifically wrong because she never arrived for her shift at work and as soon as Bob realized that Tanya wasn't coming to her shift he and his wife Dolores rushed over to the Linden police station in his area and they tried to report her as missing. So like I said Bob and Dolores rock up to this Linden 
police station and the Linden police then say, but it hasn't been 24 hours. You can't report your daughter as missing. And I'm not sure if the laws have maybe changed in South Africa or maybe it's because we watch so many American TV shows or overseas TV shows. But the law in South Africa states that you can report someone missing at any time. You don't need to wait 24 hours to report them missing. So when Bob and Dolores walked into that Linden police station, they were supposed to help them and they were supposed to try and find their daughter that was now missing. For whatever reason, the Linden police refused to help Bob and told him to go away until the next day. So Bob literally did. He left and he came back at the absolute crack of dawn to report his daughter missing for the next day. However, when Bob and Dolores got back to the Linden police station, they decided, oh no, we can't do your missing persons report because we don't have any of those missing persons papers to put up as flyers everywhere. So you need to go to the Fairlands police station and report her missing there. So not only have the Linden police given Bob and Dolores misinformation about the 24 hour, but they've also missed that 24 hour window. And as I'm sure we both know, we watch a lot of crime and we know on these crime shows that 24 hours to 48 hours are incredibly important windows for missing people or missing persons. And there's so much that could go down in these 28 to 48 hours that the South African police force have now missed and now turned away a grieving and scared family because of some misinformation or kind of just shooing them away. And it's incredibly sad and horrific as we go through the rest of this case. So firstly, Bob and Dolores were incredibly irritated by this. But they did what they were told and they went to Phelan's police station to now report their daughter Tanya missing there. But then the police in this police station said that they couldn't report her missing or they couldn't file any documentation because they didn't have a picture of Tanya on hand. So Bob said, okay, Dolores, you wait here. I'm going to come back. So Bob then drove back home to his house. He then drove back to Phelan's police station and he then had a copy of Tanya's ID photo, which he then handed to the police. The police then look at this tiny photo. It's only a few centimeters long and they then look at this photo and they're like oh no we can't do anything with this it's too small we need a full body shot of Tanya now by this point Bob was absolutely frothing at the mouth he was so upset with everyone and he was now begging the police to do the simple job of just reporting his daughter missing that's all he wanted to do was to let people know that she's missing she's not coming home please can someone help him look for her and the police kept saying we can't do anything with your little ID photo go away and come back and Bob was not having it he started shouting and swearing at the police the police then started shouting and swearing at him it was an absolute mess and eventually after I'm sure some very colorful words were exchanged the police have finally agreed to put Tanya as a missing person but it is now Monday the 16th of June 2003 so Tanya has now been missing for three days officially and three days is a long time for someone to be missing and for someone to even start looking for a missing person so an investigating officer was dispatched to the Flower Day residence and he knocked on the door Dolores opens it and he walks through and immediately as he walks into the flower day house he then stops and he says oh you know Mrs. Flower Day and Mr. Flower Day I know what's wrong with your daughter and I think that she isn't dead there's nothing wrong with her she's just on a drug binge and there was absolutely no evidence to support that Tanya was even interested in drugs have ever taken them before or was even interested in taking them the night that she went missing so all this information that Dolores is busy getting from this investigating officer is a bit much. She needs some air, she needs some time to breathe. So Dolores leaves, she goes out the front door and she starts walking to the post box just to get some air. And she opens the post box, she looks inside and she finds Tanya's ID. And this isn't Tanya's ID, this is my ID, but I'm not going to show you my horrible ID photo. But basically Dolores opens the post box, she finds Tanya's ID, She's absolutely hysterical. She then calls the investigating officer. He comes outside. He opens the post box and he starts paging through all of it with no gloves, mind you. So he's busy paging through her ID. He finds nothing. He then takes her ID back inside. He throws it on a table inside the house and he then continues to go on about how he feels that Tanya is still on this drug binge. Now I'm sure based on Bob's history, there was probably some colorful language exchanged in his own home with this officer as well because the officer left with taking only a few notes and not really trying to help in any other way. So then on Tuesday the 17th of June 2003, Tanya was now missing officially for four days with absolutely zero progress to her missing person report. And in fact, police officers had not even gathered a search party to look for Tanya. There was no type of search party done with the police or with the neighborhood. Nothing was ever organized for her. 
and Bob was incredibly irritated and frustrated that no one was doing anything to help try and find his daughter. So Bob then drove back to the Fairland police on Tuesday the 17th of June. He's now driving back to the police station. He gets there and he says he wants to speak to the person who came to his house yesterday, the investigating officer. The police all then turn around who are in the station and they're like, we don't know who that is. There's no guy or no police officer who actually works here with that name. Now Bob absolutely starts raging again and he starts shouting at the police officers saying, what do you mean there's no police officer with that name? You sent him to my house. He came there. He touched my daughter's ID everywhere with no gloves and now you're telling me he doesn't even work here. And now with all this commotion going on in the main hall of the police station, the commander of the police station actually walks out and he starts shouting at Bob. Bob starts shouting at him. There's a screaming match between these two again and eventually they calm down. The commander then tells him to come back to his office we can talk about this and let's see what we can do so the commander then says that guy that came to your house yesterday isn't a police officer he's actually a police reservist and if you don't know what a police reservist is it's actually someone who volunteers to work at a police station so they do some paperwork for the police to try and help them with their load a little bit but the police actually sent this police reservist to a live investigation and to try and find information to a grieving family and then to also not have the proper equipment or proper training to be able to take down information. And then this police reservist even has the audacity to tell the Flower Day family his theory on what he believes happened to their daughter. So after this heated exchange with the commander, the commander then tells Bob that actually Tanya Flower Day's case has now been sent back to the Linden police station because it's no longer in their jurisdiction because Bob and Dolores live closer to the Linden police station than the other police station. So there's this entire back and forth and this entire bureaucracy about whose jurisdiction is actually and Bob must now actually go back to Linden's police station. So Bob and Dolores, I'm sure incredibly frustrated, get back in their car and head over to the Linden police station where they now are trying to find out more information about their daughter's case. But when they got to the Linden police station, the police officers on duty at the time said they had no idea about Tanya Flowerday's case. So now we fast forward to another day and it's now Wednesday the 18th of June 2003, Tanya has now officially been missing for five days. Bob and Dolores then go back to the Linden police station and they now want answers as to why the case is not being taken seriously at all. Two investigators who were on duty at the time heard this commotion going on in the front of the police office and they then talk to Bob and Dolores and say maybe we should go down to the morgue, maybe just for peace of mind to see if your daughter is there or not. So Dolores and Bob agree and then the two police officers take both of them to the Johannesburg morgue. And sadly, this is where they would come face to face with their daughter, Tanya. Tanya's body was in an horrific state. She was beaten, bloody and broken in many aspects. And Tanya was lying in a section of unidentified bodies uncovered on a metal trolley for everyone to see, apparently. The person who was in the morgue at the time said that Tanya had been there since Saturday the 14th of June, which means that she was there the day after she was first reported missing. So for at least four days, Tanya was lying in this morgue, uncovered, unclaimed, and no one seemed to really care about her. So when Tanya's parents actually identified Tanya, the people who were running the morgue actually gave Tanya's parents back her clothes that she was wearing that night. And then Tanya's parents took the clothes back home. And Dolores said that after a couple of days, she couldn't bear to look at this bag of Tanya's clothes. And she then put Tanya's clothes into the washing machine and then washed them because they were absolutely drenched in blood. Then a few days after Dolores had actually cleaned Tanya's clothes, the police then call the Flower Day family and be like, oh, you know those clothes that the morgue gave you? Can we actually have them back because we need to find any forensic evidence that were on the clothes? And Dolores is like, well oops, I kind of already washed them. And to be fair to Dolores, by the time she had actually gotten Tanya's clothes, it had been handled by so many people that the forensic evidence on her clothes was probably destroyed anyway. But it was still bad on the part of the morgue to give her the clothes in the first place. Now, I do just want to defend the police just a tiny little bit because apparently the Linden police station and their officers were incredibly swamped with cases. There were only 36 officers in that entire police station and there were at least 2,200 cases that these police officers had to spread between all of them. And also, not only that, but there were only three vehicles for all of these 36 officers to use 
and to try and investigate with. So not only were police officers actually spread very thinly, but also the resources were incredibly thin as well. So I kind of understand, sadly, how Tanya's case could get lost in all of this. But despite all of this, and despite the immense load of work that these police officers in the London station had, one of the investigating officers, Christelle Stainer Abel, actually asked the commander in the station if she could take on Tanya's case. He said yes, he's like, you're more than welcome to take the case on. And Crystal hit the ground running with this case. And she started with Tanya's phone records from the beginning. And she noticed that Tanya had actually called someone from inside the club a couple of hours after she was dropped off from her dad. And then she also called someone on the Saturday morning at about half past one in the morning. And then at around 2 p.m. on Saturday, the phone was actually switched off because the SIM card was taken out. So Inspector Cristal thinks maybe the phone was stolen or someone had removed her SIM card and put in theirs. But as a side note, Inspector Cristal was only given this case on the 7th of June, 2003, so around a month after Tanya's body was found. So because Inspector Cristal had very little to work on, she decided to enlist the help of police informants. And one police informant actually came to her with some information, and he then pointed out a man called Ronald. Ronald Edward Grimsley, who was a 25-year-old male, worked for a film production company where he made TV advertisements. Ronald was quite well known to the police as he was constantly in and out of the police station for a lot of drug charges. And Ronald had actually been seen by a few people in the club the night that Tanya went missing. And he was also seen leaving the club with Tanya that night. And a friend of Tanya's who actually worked in the club said that he had never seen this guy Ronald before. And he said that Tanya was in the club and she was there for a couple of hours. But then soon after she was on her phone, she then called someone and then this guy Ronald rocked up. They then started talking for about 10 minutes and then they left the club. And this was according to Tanya's friend who worked in the club. But even though Tanya's friend didn't know him, apparently Bob Flowerday Tanya's father and this was because Tanya had introduced Ronald to her mom and dad a couple of days before she went to the club. So Ronald Grimsley was arrested on July 18th 2003 and it was during the entire police investigation and questioning that Ronald cracked and he revealed a lot of details pertaining to Tanya's murder that only the murderer would know like where her body was left, what state her body was in and he also then stood in front of the magistrate who was like the main guy in the court and he confessed to the magistrate exactly what he had done. So while Ronald was in the holding cell in the Linden police station he managed to get hold of a really sharp piece of glass and he then ended up cutting himself he also then managed to tear a piece of the bed sheet and he then tied that around his neck and he tried to hang himself but luckily he was found quite quickly the police then cut him down and they took him to the hospital where unfortunately doctors did diagnose him with brain damage and they said that he was brain dead but they would keep him in a coma to see if anything would happen or if he maybe made a recovery there was also apparently a note that Ronald left inside the cell where he basically described that he was a very hectic drug addict and that he needed ways to pay for his addiction and this was one way that he could pay for it and he's incredibly sorry to the Flower Day family for what he had done. However, after two months of Ronald being in a coma, he miraculously actually woke up and as soon as he woke up, he kept saying he wants to talk to Investigator Crystal and the doctors were like, okay, just give it a few days. Once we heal you and you're a bit better, you can then talk to the investigator. So a few days went and Ronald did get a chance to talk to Investigator Crystal and he was adamant that he wanted to tell her the rest of his story. So Ronald claimed that he was a long-term drug user and he was constantly in and out of rehab around five different times and each time failed. And because he was using for so many years, he had built up a massive amount amount of debt and because he had no money to pay this debt he then made a deal with the dealers. So according to Ronald on the night of Friday the 13th of June 2003 Tanya a girl who Ronald had probably only known for a few days had called him from the club saying that she wants to be picked up and I'm not sure if Tanya had maybe agreed to spend more private time with Ronald or she just wanted to lift home but the two of them then left the club. They then drove to an area called Fontainebleau, where apparently Ronald said that they met with two Nigerian men. Ronald then apparently had sex with Tanya, and then once he was done, he then said to the Nigerian men that they could have sex with 
Tanya as well. They then took over. They then had their turn. And apparently, according to Ronald, they then beat her. They then strangled her and they murdered her. And Ronald claimed that everything was recorded and it was actually a snuff film. And if you don't know what a snuff film is, it's basically like a murder recorded on film. And Ronald had said that he had given Tanya to these men. And because he had given Tanya what he wanted in return was all of his debt to be gone which apparently they paid. Ronald then said that these two men then put Tanya in the back of his car and they then drove Tanya to the spot where they then put her body sitting upright against the wall. Now Inspector Cristal was listening and looking at Ronald and taking all the information that he was saying and she said that there was some evidence to back up what he was saying because one, he was actually a long time addict and she could assume that he probably had a lot of debt and she said that Tanya's injuries were absolutely horrific. Just a warning before you listen to all of this is quite graphic. Tanya had sustained a lot of injuries and incredibly brutal injuries. She had a lot of scratch marks and cuts all over her face and neck, but specifically on her back. Tanya had been beaten in the face and on the arms. They assume it was probably with a very blunt object and she had also been beaten quite a lot around the eyes because her eyes were almost closed shut. Now not only had Tanya gone through all of those injuries, but sadly more investigation had been done on Tanya's body and it was also found that there was immense injuries to her private areas and there was sadly quite severe tearing from both areas down there. Tanya had actually been strangled to death so Tanya's final moments were incredibly very very violent and most detectives believe that this couldn't have been done by one person but some detectives did think that it was only Ronald who did this. So with all the evidence from Ronald and also their own investigation this took them to Heelbrow in Johannesburg. And this took them to a man named Onyebachi Mbanefo, and he was a 33-year-old man from Nigeria who was known as quite the drug lord in the area, apparently. And he was taken into custody on the 3rd of October 2003. But he wasn't taken into custody for any links of Tanya, he was actually just taken on charges. But police did take all of his computers and all of his videotapes, and they started now combing through all of his information. Now, while police were actually trying to look through all this information, Ronald then speaks up and he wants to speak to investigator Crystal again. So the investigator comes through to his cell and then Ronald tells her, actually, there's no snuff movie. We didn't make any films. It was only me. I was the only one who did this. So according to Ronald again, this is what he told the investigators. He said that on Friday the 13th of June 2003, he had been taking a lot of drugs. He said that he had bought heroin in Hillbrow, which he apparently had mixed with tobacco. And then he smoked weed and drank a lot of alcohol. And just when he had finished drinking his alcohol, Tanya then called him and said she wants him to fetch her. So Ronald then drives to the club. They, he then talks to Tanya for a little bit. They then leave the club on the way to Tanya's parents' house. But before getting to Tanya's parents' house, Ronald says that he needs to stop at his mom's house because he's really hungry and he hasn't had anything to eat. So when they get to Ronald's mom's house, Tanya and Ronald apparently start kissing and then Tanya kind of pushes him away because she doesn't want to go any further. Ronald then says fine, but then he tries again and Tanya then pushes him away again and gets angry. He says okay, okay. They then get back in the car. They leave Ronald's mom's house without eating anything. And then they drive down to a place called Darren Wood where Ronald then stops the car. He, and he then turns to Tanya and he says, I'm really sorry for what I did. I didn't mean to push you. And then he proceeds to try and kiss her again. Tanya then pushes him away again because she doesn't want to kiss Ronald. And then Ronald gets upset. He then pulls out a pipe out of his cubbyhole and he then starts smoking heroin. Tanya was not into this at all. She was actually very upset that he did this in front of her. She starts confronting Ronald and then she grabs Ronald's pipe. Ronald apparently gets incredibly upset with her and he says that he then completely blanked out and when he came back he said that his hands were around her throat, her pants were off and his pants were off and he doesn't remember murdering her or having his way with her. Now the investigators were obviously listening to this and they were going through all of what he was saying but they found so many holes in what he was saying because he said that if you had taken that much heroin you wouldn't have had the energy to do all of this before blanking out. And experts said that the amount of heroin that apparently Ronald said that he had taken would have made him more comatose than an active in the sense of being able to strangle and do all of these horrific things to Tanya's body and then still have the memory and to be able to then come to your senses, stop what you're doing, put Tanya's clothes back on, put her back in the car, drive her body away, place her in a seating position and then drive away. And the expert then said that there was so much going on with his story that it was impossible just from the amount of heroin he smoked 
to be able to do these things. And investigators wondered why Ronald suddenly changed his story from a story that was plausible to a story that had so many holes that could be disproved. They thought that maybe Ronald was being threatened because when his parents would come and visit him, they looked worried and they thought maybe it was just worry because Ronald was in this situation. But they also thought maybe Ronald's family was being threatened as well and he thought that he needed to change his story to protect himself and to protect his family. Then on March 17, 2004, Ronald was advised to go into some psychiatric testing by his lawyer because the, his lawyer felt that he was not of sound mind. The trial date was then set for the 31st of August 2004 and when Ronald came out of his psychiatric testing they found him to be of sound mind and before he went into the psychiatric testing he had pleaded guilty to everything but now coming out of it, he then pleaded not guilty to everything. And the reason that he pleaded not guilty was because he wasn't of sober mind at the time that he had done everything to Tanya, apparently. And the prosecution tried to prove that Ronald had done all of this because Tanya refused his advances. He then got upset and then he murdered her because he couldn't get his way with her. So this trial dragged out for many months. But then on January the 7th, 2005, Investigator Cristal was actually arrested based on corruption and apparently Investigator Cristal underpaid the police informants who had given her Ronald's name in the beginning and apparently what she did was she had paid them only around 50% of what they were owed and then she took the rest for herself. But then on May 5th 2005 all the charges against her were dropped. She eventually did resign but this obviously dragged out Ronald's trial a lot because she was the main person involved in this entire case. But then finally, on July 25th, 2005, Ronald's trial began again. On 26th of July, 2005, Ronald Grimsley was found guilty of all four charges made against him. He was sentenced to life. These charges that Ronald faced were for murder, which he got 18 years for. He also got 10 years for rape and 10 years for indecent assault and another two years for theft. And these sentences would be served concurrently. And that is the horrifically sad case of Tanya Flowerday. And this case still leaves so many questions as to was Ronald really threatened? Was he the only one who did all of these things? Were the other two men really involved? And I guess we will never know a truthful account unless Ronald actually comes out and tells the truth, but would we necessarily believe it in the end? And it also begs the question, does the snuff film actually exist? And if it does, this could blow the case wide open as to these other men who were involved. Or does the film just show that Ronald was actually the only guilty one? Let me know what you think down below, who was actually guilty or what you think of this case. Thank you for watching this far and for all the kind and loving support. I hope you're all staying safe out there and I'll see you again next week. Bye.